Hello, everyone. Welcome to Inconvenient Truths. I'm your host, Jennifer Zheng. Today, I will talk about a very serious issue, not in China, but in the US, that is high-tech totalitarian. Totalitarian and how it is harming our society. Then I will talk about how and why the hearts of millions of Chinese netizens were broken by a boring but detailed epidemiological survey conducted through big data. I will sure you will also be very surprised. Over the past weekend, on January 22nd, I received a notice from YouTube saying our team has reviewed your content and unfortunately we think it violates our medical misinformation policy. We've removed the following content from YouTube. I want to read out the title of that video here in case this video also becomes forbidden but you can read it on the screen. Hopefully the image of that word were not caught as a forbidden one. The removed video was an old one I did last June in which I talk about how crowded the sites were when people in China were getting their injections and tests and how someone died only five minutes after the injection. This is a fact that was also reported by mainstream Chinese language media Radio Free Asia, which is owned by the US government. Anyway, that video was removed and my channel was given a strike, which means I won't be able to do things like upload, post or live stream for one week. And I was asked to check their guidelines to learn why my video was regarded as having violated their medical misinformation policy. I did check their guidelines, which are very, very long. And I fi find such an item in their long, long guidelines. Transmission in misinformation, content that promotes transmission information that contradicts local health authorities or WHO. I immediately remembered that at the beginning of this current global crisis brought by that disease, both China's local health authorities and WHO told us that this disease was not human to human. As a result, we lost the most precious three weeks in which we could have contained this disease. Now over 5 million people have died and more than 300 million infected. By the way, the 5 million deaths don't include numbers from China as we don't know the real number yet. So do you think we should contradict China's local health authorities and WHO or not? I feel so sad that I have to practice self-censorship here. Nowadays, the big high-tech companies have become so powerful that they can decide what we can say and what we cannot say. Isn't this dangerous? How did we get to this point and how can we change this in the future? I don't have the answer, but would like to bring this question up for discussion. Please leave us a comment about what you think. Before we go to our main topic today, I'd like to show you several videos from China showing the current situation. So that's from Xi'an city. It was reported that the lockdown in Xi'an has ended now, but nobody knows how many tragedies have happened during this past 30 days. This morning, I read another widely circulated case. Someone posted on social media saying that during the lockdown in Xi'an, 
His 29-year-old sister worked in a company called Zexi Supply Chain that de delivered food to people. But she was suddenly fired on December 31st. After that, she went back to her home in Lianhu district. But the security guards didn't, didn't allow her in as the community was locked down. Her sister had nowhere to go and had to stay in her vehicle. After 16 days, she, have, she had starved and froze to death inside her vehicle. A woman as young as 29 years old starved and froze to death and died slowly, but also quickly in 16 days. What kind of common prosperity is that? Now let's watch another two short clips. Well, 村领导带队,他们不怕雪,不怕冷,不怕辛苦。Again, like I said last time, this pandemic fight has become a joke in CCP's China. But it is not just a joke, it also kills people and makes people suffer so much. Now another video showing the smallest quarantine site in Xiong'an new area in Hebei province. In Xiong, the, the Xiong'an new area was built in an attempt to replace Beijing and become the next capital city for China, but it seems that plan was abandoned. <laughs> What do you think? The Chinese words on this tiny little thing read quarantine room for patients with fever. I wonder how someone feels when staying in that kind of room in such cold weather. Maybe they want to lower the patient's temperature by putting them in the cold. Now let's check another one from Hunan province. It looks like they are doing more damage to human beings than the virus. This is a picture showing that at the staff's residential building area of Beijing Youth Daily, they are putting up barbed wires for a tighter lockdown. Now Beijing really looks like a prison, right? And uh, the Winter Olympics is open soon in there. Next, our main story today. On January 19th, the authorities held a press conference on the COVID situation in Beijing and released the so-called activity track record of a man who was infected on the previous day but didn't show any symptoms. They released all the details of where and when he had been in the past 14 days. Obviously, all the records were obtained through big data. So this is the map of, of where he had been and the following are the details. On January the 1st, from 11.30 p.m. to 4.43 a.m., he was working at Hechao Li, a place called Hechao Li Zhi. And then on January the 2nd, from 11.30 p.m. to 3 a.m., he was working at the construction site at a theater. And on January 3rd, from 9 p.m. to 1.37 a.m., he was working at a residential area at the so-called fourth ring in Beijing. 
Then he went to a waste station at Tongzhou to work. Tongzhou is more than one hour away from Beijing if one uses public transportation. On January 4th, from 2 p.m. to 2.30 p.m., he was working at Sunyi district, which is also more than one hour away from Beijing by the public transportation. On January 5th, from 2.12 p.m., he worked at Chaoyang district. He arrived at the construction site at 4 p.m. and worked there. Then he arrived at another construction site at 5 p.m. And then on January 6, from 11 a.m. to 12.08 p.m., he worked at a property site of Wan Ke in Haidian district in Beijing. He then arrived at a factory in Chaoyang district at 2.21 p.m. and arrived at another factory in Chaoyang district at 9.06 p.m. to work. And from 9.30 p.m. to 11.04 p.m., he was working at a residential building in Haidian area. On January 10, from midnight to 1.45 a.m., he was working at a shop in Dongcheng district. He arrived at another shop in the same district at 2 p.m. Then he arrived at a site in Chaoyang district at 3 p.m. He arrived at Guangzhou Industrial Area in Tongzhou District at 4 p.m. and arrived at a residential area in Sunyi District to work at 9 p.m. We don't know how long he worked there, but we do know that he had worked from midnight till at least 9 p.m. that day, and that was at least 21 hours in one day. I won't list all the details in those 14 days. I had lived in Beijing for 17 years, so I know how big Beijing is and how hard it is to get around in Beijing, regardless of whether you have a car or not. Commonly, you need at least one hour to go from one district to another one. And this man had been to five different places to work on January the 10th. Anyway, in 14 days from January 1st to January 14th, he didn't have a single day off. He had been working every day. Sometimes he worked for more than 21 hours in one day. And in all those 14 days, he only ate once at a food court in Chaoyang district. There's only one record of him eating anywhere. So for all, uh, for the, all the other meals, we can imagine that he only had something like instant noodles or several pieces of cold bread. The big data also shows that on January 17th, he went to a post office to mail a letter and did a test in that afternoon. He boarded a train from Beijing to Weihai City in Shandong province at 8.21 a.m. on January 18th but was identified as a virus carrier as the test result had come out. He was quickly located at court and ordered to leave the train at 8.57 a.m. at the South Beijing station. At 12 p.m., he was taken to a hospital in Beijing by ambulance. Why has his activity report drawn so much attention? People were shocked to find that, that he had been to 31 places to work in 14 days and never had one day off. So he was called the hardest working man in China. What kind of a person is he and why does he live such a life? It was soon found out that his surname is Yue. He is 44 years old and he worked as a loader and unloader in Beijing. This is his picture. He used to work as a crew member for a fishing boat in Weihai City in Shandong province. On August 12th, 2020, his 19-year-old son went missing. And this is his son's picture and the notice they posted up about his miss, miss, missing. 
Since his son went missing, Mr. Yue had been trying to look for him. He had been to over a dozen cities but hadn't found anything. As his son once worked in Beijing, this time he went to Beijing in hopes to find his son. While looking for his son, he had to make a living for his family too. He has another teenage boy who currently lives in Weihai City with his wife. His father is paralyzed at home in Henan province, and his mother recently broke her arm. He went to look after his mother in December and spent more than 10,000 yuan for her treatment. So he has a big family to look after and support, and that's why he had to work so hard. He rented a small room in Beijing, which cost him 700 yuan or 110 US dollars per month. He slept for only four to five hours every day. He joined some WeChat groups and got job offers from there. He carried sandbags, cement, and other construction materials at construction sites, moved construction waste to the dump, etc. What ironic is, after he was infected, the authorities can track his every move in Beijing as precisely as up to each minute. But when his son was, went missing, he had begged the police to locate his son's whereabouts using his son's cell phone, but the police refused. At that time, his son worked at a factory that is 50 kilometers away from home. One day he said he had a stomach ache and wanted to go home earlier. The factory manager sent him to the bus station, but he didn't get onto the bus and just disappeared from there. During the first two to three days, his son's cell phone was still working. So he thought it should be easy for the police to use his number to locate him. But the police just refused, saying that his son was already an adult. So they couldn't do that because that would violate his son's privacy. Then he asked the police to let him check the record of the surveillance cameras at the bus station to try to find, find some clues. But the police again refused. His wife cried for two days outside the police station, but the police just refused to help. So up to now, Mr. Yue has been to over a dozen cities to try to find his son without any success. If he had not been infected, which should be an unfortunate thing, his story and his plight would have never be become known to the public. After his story drew a lot of public attention and sympathy, last Friday on January 21st, the police department in Weihai City released an announcement saying that on August 26, 2020, that's, that was 14 days after Mr. Yue's son went missing, the police found a highly decomposed body in the pond and through DNA testing, they concluded that the body was Mr. Yue's son, but Mr. Yue and his wife refused to accept this conclusion. Mr. Yue said that when the body was first found, he had asked the police, but the police told him that the body wasn't his son. But as soon as he started to petition about this matter, they said that the body was his son. But the instinct of both himself and his wife told them that the body wasn't their son when they saw it. They requested reconfirmation and bone tests, but they re the police refused. So that's why he's still looking. After he won the title of the hardest working man in China, many people said that they had shed tears for his miseries. But he said, quote, I don't feel sorry for myself. I just work hard. I do not steal or rob. I earn money with my own hands. I earn money so that I can look for my son. I work hard just to live, to take care of my family. I've spent tens of thousands so far in order to look for my son. I take up casual jobs. I work hard to get my son back. I want to work harder, even if I have to pay with my life. 
I still want to find my son and bring him back home, unquote. Well, these are the stories for today. We all suffer different things in life. So this show of mine today won't be able to be streamed or uploaded to my main channel. I'm not sure how many people will get to see this one as I only have 1,132 subscribers on my second channel on which I'm streaming this. But let's learn from Mr. Yue and just try harder. Also, please do consider signing up for a membership or making a donation at my website at jenniferzengblog.com. When the big tech companies are suppressing free speech on their platforms, we can at least stay connected via my own website. Thank you. See you soon.